What's going on, Wolfpack Nation? We are back for part two, y'all, of our interview here and discussion here with Joe Giglio, uh, a, uh, a friend of the show and, uh, again, has been with us a couple of uh, years in a row now. I think it's his third year in, in a row. You can always check out him and uh, Joe Uvi's new venture on specifically on YouTube. I mean, again, we're a YouTube channel primarily, and uh, so I, I got to give a shout-out more to the YouTube side because, Again, it's always nice to see the people and see, you know, their their conversations rather than just hearing it, right? I mean, that that's always been at least my thing. Is like like the podcast. I was like, great if you're riding down the road or standing a fence, like me, for example, where you're just you know you can't really watch but you can listen. But I mean, to see it is is definitely a different experience. Have you got any kind of feedback like that, Joe? That's a little bit better to see you guys talk through it all like have you guys kind of got any feedback like that uh it's mostly been uh, on the podcast side which is good oh dang it i'm 40 okay the youths i feel like prefer to 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 download it and have it and drive in the car and listen so yeah i'll I'll take all uh downloads that's it they all count right you know you name it i'm there we got it that's right. Yeah, in fact, I was listening to you guys uh, on the uh, on the way to Columbia last week, so I uh, had you on there for a couple of episodes. So I enjoyed those. Appreciate um, it. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, but do you? Um, I was gonna just ask real quick. Did you when you got into like the print side of the house because that's where you you know made your bread and butter? Did you ever think, you know, fifteen twenty years from then you'd be doing a podcast and you know and uh, <laughs> because you know when you first got into print, like there really wasn't podcast right so or maybe it might have been in, in, in its infancy one of my proudest moments is there's a picture from i think it's the O four duke carolina game over at cameron and you guys are might be old enough to remember this you might not be i was in the military we're good when you covered games back then everybody had a notepad and they mm-hmm. add out to press row and dude, I think it was 04. There's a picture that Jay Billis had put out a couple. It was, I think it was two years ago. I'm the, you see one person with a computer and it was me. And I remember Lennox Rawlings and Colton Tudor and, and some of the other great writers in the state being like, why do you have your computer with you? Why don't you, you know, that you write after the game, Joe, you know this, right? <laughs> and not in a bad way just like hey this and i would try to explain to them because i started believe it or not what was a, a nno's first blog a, a major outlet's first blog in the state and it was like wait what is this and it's like dude, it's just the same thing you're doing you're just doing it in real time yeah. um so if you were to say to me am i gonna uh, would i be in doing a pod no i would probably not but i would say quite proudly that i've always kind of been ahead of the curve a little bit so uh I, i'm i'm happy to still be there yeah well and of course you say that you, you say that joe but it took you probably three or four episodes to get a daggone good microphone man i mean <laughs> <laughs> it did it was least, so, i remember that too. at least two weeks <laughs> yeah yeah so joe i, I do want to kind of get into here obviously i've always been a fan of yours uh specifically the highlight of my of at least my favorite moments for sure was uh, back in uh, man, what year was it? 2016. I believe it was Mark Godfrey's last year. And man, you did your best work that year I've ever seen, man. Like, like dude, ask, asking Mark Godfrey, you do know that fans aren't going to see a loss to Boston college as improvement. Right. And then your famous, uh, you know, after, you know, losing to George tech, we got to choose to play tougher. And you were like, you know, what, what are you seeing? And I'm like, I'm like, yes, Jillio. Yes. Stick it to this guy. This guy's saying we got to choose to play tougher. Like, like, what do you mean? Choose saying, no, you are going to play tougher. You are going to play defense. Like, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. So yeah, yeah, no, for sure. So, but it was kind of funny cause I was listening uh, to, uh, uh, I don't know why it came up, it came up on my recommendations, but I watched, uh, the beginning part, I didn't watch the whole thing of uh, Mark Gottfried's uh, announcement as head coach. And uh, of course, he brought up, you know, the the dream of playing in the greatest show on earth. And of course, you know, I, I slide my forehead being like, oh, my God, like, you know, again, like, I think that maybe, t- you know, 10 years ago when he was hired, that obviously at that point, it only had been 20 years since we won any kind of championship. But now I feel like that 30 years in, it's like, listen, when the ACC and then guess what? If you win the ACC, you get to the tournament. Mind blown. And so, I mean, 
I know that Keith doesn't really talk too much about, you know, necessarily the importance of like, you know, winning a championship specifically, but I know that you have had conversations from him for sure. Do you kind of get that sense of, um, that he understands the the pressure and the importance of that AC championship? Because again, it, it, it's much more likely to win AC championship. I don't know if you know this or not. than win a national championship, I would say. Yeah, I, I think with Kevin, you know, it's hard when you've won it. And Mark was an assistant yeah. at UCLA. Kevin was an assistant at Louisville. And, mm-hmm. you know, when you have a chance and you experience it, you think, well, this is it. This is this is what I want. And it almost would take, in my opinion, and, I, you know, I'm not interested in Kevin going anywhere, but it would almost – take Levi being the head coach. It would take Justin Ganey being the head coach. It would take Archie being the head coach. It would take someone coming back and being like, uh, you know, when Maryland won the ACC tournament in 04, it was like the Mm -hmm. equivalent to them of winning the national title in 02 because they hadn't won the ACC championship under Gary Williams. So it was like, it was a really big deal. And I I think anyone who's, been through the program or understands NC State history. Shout out to Scott Wood, who does uh, well. what's going to be Law of the Wolf now with me. And he's quickly become an NC State fan. Like, he dropped a, a Chris Paul nut punch on me during the back, during the basketball season. And I'm like, were you even alive for the Chris Paul nut punch? And he was like, oh, I, I, I State fans, I know about it. And I'm like, okay, all right. Well, I'm proud of you. Um, yeah. So, yeah. I just think it takes someone who, who's kind of been around it, but that doesn't diminish what a coach thinks of that, of the accomplishment. I, I think it's hard. And I thought Giannis Antetokounmpo put it best, right? After this year, I think someone asked him if he thought the year was a failure, you know, they had the best record in the NBA during the regular season. And he had said to them, Michael Jordan played in the NBA for 15 years. He won the championship six times. So were the other nine years of failure. Right. And yeah, Giannis is obviously in a position where they've had some success and obviously Michael Jordan had success, but it is, it, it, when you look at it, you're like, that's why I said to you, it's the dumbest stat of all time that not once have they been able to fall backwards into this thing when even every other college seemingly has, that's the part of it that doesn't make any sense. You know, you go back, man, we could really open some wounds here, but you go back to like Oh three with JJ Reddick hitting 4 million threes. Uh, this is before JJ Reddick was really JJ Reddick, by the way. Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you go back and you look at, uh, Tory Smith and Maryland in 2010 and you're like, wait, I gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> right. You have these moments, yeah. of course, all of the 27 inning games that Elliot's played and all the other nonsense mm-hmm. that we've seen and in, in different. Yeah. You look at, you look at the, the coastal game oh. that year. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. You, you have, can't uh, do it. Yeah. so but yeah. it, it just doesn't really make any sense, but I do think. I, I don't, I don't, you know, like for example, Dave Doran, like last year, I don't think he went into the year thinking, oh, it's, we're going to go eight and four and it's going to be okay with this group. <laughs> I don't, or even the year before, remember where a Miami loss is what ultimately cost them a chance to play for the, for the conference championship. I, yeah. I just think. It, You're cutting me deep, Shrek. I, I just think <laughs> it's hard as a coach to try to keep your players focused on maybe something as elusive as that when you know the fans understand it more than the players do and that doesn't mean the players don't care it just means the play or the coach doesn't care it just means the coach's job is to motivate the players in the moment in that moment and i think that's one of the things i've learned most from kevin and that is especially this generation of basketball players. It's not an original point, but it's really is the truth. They play so much basketball and they go to these AAU tournaments. They play three games in a day and you're like, well, you lost one game and you're like, Oh, we got another one in two minutes. Yeah. So it right. doesn't necessarily. And and now of course, with the portal and players leaving and guys moving around the idea that you're going to find players who understand your school's history is pretty far fetched. Yeah. Well, yeah. case in point, you had Jarkel wearing the Jordan jersey last year, right? Yeah. 
honest mistake. Didn't know no. anything. Yeah. yeah. You know, just yeah. wear, wear, wear the jersey. We're wearing, we're wearing some gear. And so, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, and I think that's that's the greatest point you can make is you want to go get guys that fit your culture and fit your scheme, but aren't so caught up in, in all the history, right? Because – at the end of the day, that's all outside noise to them. Like they, they're there yeah. to do their job. They, they're, you know, let's be real. Yeah. Well, and especially because again, I mean, like if next year the team, the men's basketball team, wins the ACC championship, to them they'll be obviously very excited about it. They'll be like, "Hey, we're going to the tournament, baby. Let's go!" But then in the meantime, back in Raleigh, <laughs> everything is going to be on fire. Yes. Everybody's going to be kissing everybody. Like mayhem will be erupting as if like it is. December 31st, 1999. Like it is going to be chaos and it's going to be awesome. So uh, looking forward to that. Uh, but I, I do got to, Joe, uh, you know, per tradition, we definitely got to have a conversation about football. Okay. And, uh, you know, obviously, Joe, if, if, you know, if you've seen or, you know, anybody who's seen any of our live streams recently knows that I am like the guy that even though it will never happen, I am the guy that is pushing like crazy for a hundred percent acceptance of coach Doran being head football coach at NC state. Cause I'm like, there is no way you can make a, 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 a realistic story. It, you know, explain to me why coach Doran should not be head coach. And like, to me, it almost is the level of, of like the video that Joe Ovi's made about Rob Brendan Moore being like, Oh wait, you're asking if Rob Brendan on the hot seat. No. Yeah. Like, just like, that's it. Like case point. No, he's not on the hot seat. And so for me, with Coach Dorn, I mean, having multiple nine-win seasons, should have had a 10-win season if UCLA had some, you know what, which they're definitely paying uh, at right now. And, uh, you know, also to having just one of the, like, like there is so much excitement around the football program with the new scoreboard, you know, the new sound system, uh, having guys like Peyton Wilson come back, which if you asked me two years ago if he was coming back last year, I would said, Probably not. And now he's coming back another year and then having Brennan Armstrong, who was a borderline Heisman candidate last year, uh, you know, two years ago. I mean, could you make any kind of case besides the obvious one of not winning AC championship that for Coach Doran to not be head coach NC State? No. Yeah. Okay. No. Yeah. Simple. Yeah. One word answer, Joe. We'll leave it at that. Yeah. I mean, I think. No. I think most cool. people have accepted what Dave is and what his limitations are, and but also what his upside is and, and what you'd be surprised. I know you're around social media, Joe. You, I'm, I'm sure you've seen as many people calling for Dave Doran's head, just like just like myself. Especially after the Boston College after loss. last year. Especially after the Boston College loss. Yeah, the Boston Actually, College loss. That was, that was, that was, but that was I don't. No, of a penalty that should have been called is not called and would never be called like a hundred times in a hundred different stadiums. Like I those are the kind of things like I don't blame coaches for. I mean, I, I thought the Syracuse game um was not his finest hour. Like they, they went into the game thinking they were gonna win with like a safety and a block punt. Like you can't do that in twenty twenty three. Um yeah. but no, I mean I think we can accept in 10 years now what Dave is and what he isn't. And, yeah, you know, I, I would love for him to have that breakthrough. Uh, I do wonder, yeah. you know, ho- hopefully Robert and I will, will have a little bit of a, a different element and maybe might have a stronger voice than either Tim Beck or even, or even Eli. So we'll, you know, we'll see, we'll see how it all yeah. turns out. Is so, that- there's no reason to like, you know, let's not do we have to get crazy already? No. Okay. No, no absolutely not. All right. Well, no, okay. Well, no, I mean, we can... to hear <laughs> I haven't heard that much about I'll, most of what I heard and talked about last year with Dave was the opportunity for him to leave. Right. Because I do. Yeah, he too. is someone that other programs would want. Um, but obviously he's comfortable with not only the school in the area, but, I think he does kind of get what it would mean to, you know, finally climb that mountain and win the ACC championship here. But Joe, you know, this fan base, I mean, you've taken their calls for many years, so (laughs) you, you, you you can get why they would potentially say the things that they say. Oh no. Yeah. I think state fans are more rational than they get credit. 
credit for. Because there's there's a crazy okay. portion of every fan base. Hundred um, percent. I spent more money on football last year than I than I ever did in any year, and I have more empathy too. for fans Me last too. year than at any point. Maybe even particularly leaving that Boston College game. Um, but it, you know, I mean, that's part of it. You, when you spend the money and you invest in it, not only emotionally but financially, you're like. Why can't we have something nice to hold <laughs> and be ours, right? <laughs> I, yeah. I mean, I'm the biggest yeah. sucker, Joe. I traveled 8,000 miles last year for football alone. I believe it. Yeah. I totally and, – and you're not alone, and that's the thing. Right. I don't – you know, you say, oh, I know the fans. I do know the fans, and a lot of them are – most of them are very rational. They just want mm-hmm. to enjoy something. They want to have success. And it's really mm-hmm. hard yep. in this area – when Carolina and Duke have had, you know, their their success. And it's hard when you want to just say, yeah, but and then it, you can't have it, right? right. Yeah, so, absolutely. So is Dave Dorn a top four ACC football coach? Um, I mean, you're, now you're going to make me think about who's actually still in the ACC. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I think Dave Clawson is the best coach in the ACC. Okay. Interesting. A game day type deal. Uh, well, I'll give you a hint, Joe. If if Mike Norvell is in your top four, then you and I are going to have some problems. Uh, no, I wouldn't put Mike Norvell there. I'm, Not yet. No way. Who else is in? The, well, it's been, there's been so much and change, so much movement, right? and Pat Narduzzi. So it's it's typically Pat Narduzzi, Dave Clawson, and Dabo Swinney and Dorn that, at least to me, are in my top four and in most people's top four. Dabo, I would say. yeah. That, uh, keep an eye on the guy and. Louisville, he can really coach. Brom, Jeff Brom. Mm-hmm. Yep. yep. So yeah, college awesome. can really coach it. In he's an in-game coach too. Halfley. There's different mm-hmm. things, right? Like if we we're talking about the portal and managing your players and developing players and put them in the NFL, then you know Dave's in the top three uh, in terms yeah. of like game day decisions and in-game coaching. I, I I don't know if I'd put him that high, but identifying talent I put him pretty high right you know get the, right. the resources that he has doing what he can at a program that's you know historically a 500 program yeah I, i'd put him pretty high again i, I think in year yeah. 10 it's a matter of understanding what he is and and, and accepting what he isn't yeah before well, we continue i want to take a quick second to tell you about our sponsor flatlands Jessup insurance group that has our whole world covered with agents in five offices throughout Eastern North Carolina to help you decide how much coverage you need. Offering policies for home and auto, recreational vehicles, commercial, crop, health, life, and employee benefits. They are able to combine options to find a comprehensive solution that works for you. Flatlands Jessup protects the things you love so you can spend less time wearing and more time enjoying them. Find them on Facebook and Instagram at Flatlands Jessup. You can also visit their webpage at www.flatlandsjessup.com. So please make sure to go and check them out. Well, and, and I, I'm, I'm 100% in agreement with you that we have, us at Tuffy Talk have always been Dave Clawson truthers being like, like, and we love Dave Clawson so much that we honestly hate Wake Forest fans being like, you don't even understand how good of a job this guy is doing with absolutely nothing, nothing. potatoes, yeah. my friend. Like, you have given him nothing, and he has given you great season, NFL talent. He's giving you everything, like, like, so – that's the thing that's the biggest bug. But um, I did want to ask you, though, I mean, obviously up until this point, I think it's without, you know, without MJ fully saying it. I mean, I I would say he's pretty much locked in, you know, new truck, you know, he definitely involved in Savage Wolves. Um, I, to me, I feel like that, honestly, if it, if it stays true that basically MJ has bought into – more than likely, again, and, and let me know if you think differently, that Brandon Armstrong will go, will be the starting quarterback for instance next year and then give MJ an opportunity to learn the offense, to develop, to get stronger, uh, you know, to get healthy. Uh, to me, that would be one of, I think, Dorn's biggest victories, you know, I wouldn't necessarily say all time, but but in definitely in recent history, just because of the fact that, I mean, with, with the talent that MJ showed last year, uh, like it, it would have been just a cut and paste. Like, yeah, no, a guy that's very, very good. Who's now getting overrun by a senior quarterback. Yeah, no, he's gone. Like guaranteed. Just go ahead and write it. I've seen it a million times. He's gone. 
And so, I mean, to me, I think that you kind of said that identify on talent, but also too, just holding on to talent again, Peyton Wilson sticking around, uh, you know, uh, I mean, there really has like, it's almost seems like every single year it's been Doran almost having to push guys out just cause like, listen, guys, we only have certain amount of scholarships. Somebody has to go. Like we, we don't want you to go, but it's just, it, there's numbers here. So, I mean, would you kind of agree with that assessment about MJ? And would you, would you agree with me saying that, I mean, Brandon Armstrong more likely will be the starting quarterback for the state next year? Yeah, I expect Brendan to be the starter. Um, it'll be interesting to see what happens with MJ. I would love for him to be able to redshirt this year and yeah, come same. back, be a star, full grasp of the offense, and, and, and be super comfortable with what he's doing, be healthy in what he's doing. That would be that'd be awesome, quite frankly. Uh, yeah. And if he chooses after not playing or whatever happens this year, I wouldn't blame him either way. Uh, you know, again, the, that gets down to the choice of where do you where do you see your path to success, and what do you what do you want? What is your ultimate goal? You know, I, I think MJ. Yeah. There were a couple of times. I think it was the weight game, which he ultimately did get hurt in, right? Where he got popped a couple of times because he yeah. thought he was still football popped. and was going to outrun some people, and he no, he got hammered a couple of different times. But that's part of learning and. You know, he showed some talent. He showed some moxie. I really wanted to see him start on the road. Uh, that was the one thing out of the sample size last year that I really just wanted to see. Mm. Probably finishes that year. You say, MJ, you're our quarterback. You you give some NIL money to him, and then you go out and get a receiver for him. Uh, or you go out and get a left tackle, whatever, whatever might be the case. But the way that it turned out, mm. you know, with Armstrong, and uh, it was a pretty smart move. Now, can you keep? MJ and have him ready to go next year. That would, like you say, that would be a really good plan for NC State if they could pull it off. Yeah, absolutely. And again, unprecedented move. Again, just like we were saying, I mean, just in today's day and age, it's not really something that's seen a whole lot. Um, so, uh, but I do gotta say, Joe, kind of, uh, you know, talking about last year, it was it was funny that I still remember when uh, I can't remember who was talking about. It wasn't me, but somebody was, you know, talking about. You know how typically, you know, most of it, Dave Dorn's years has been, you know, an eight and four season, give or take. And I remember you saying like, Psh, like, like, no, not like, you know, the, the bar for that last year should be way higher than eight and four. I remember uh, messaging you guys when you were doing the uh, the tournament where you guys, you know, people would call in and give their predictions of records and who they were going to lose to or whatever. And I said, 13 and one, we're going to go 12 and 0, we're going to win the AC championship, but we're going to lose in, in, uh, uh, to Alabama in the college ball playoffs. And that's how it's going to go. And uh, man, did I get my teeth kicked in very early against ECU. Like that, I've, I don't, I've never felt that way before in my life. Like with so much excitement that we just beat ECU at ECU, but with so much like what the heck just <laughs> happened was so much like sadness being like, like Leary looked terrible. Like it shouldn't have even come to that. It, it, it was just, yeah, it, it was the weirdest year last year for sure. But I mean, did did you kind of get a sense early? Because like to me, I kind of looked at it as, okay, maybe that was just a fluke, you know, just a, you know, a one-off, but, you know, hopefully we'll get out of this rust and we'll get back rolling. Or did you kind of see that as kind of a writing on the wall that it seemed to kind of start to turn into a little yeah, bit? Yeah, ECU was a giant red flag. But they were okay. but yeah, no. Yeah. Yeah, it didn't look good. No. And, go ahead, Greg. No, I was going to say, say record wise, eight and four, but you look how you got to eight and four. So do you call that a success? Sure. I thought it was a good season. I thought it was, they were good to get to eight and four with the way that it unfolded. Um, but, I, you know, I, the, the Clemson second half to me was not good. Um, the Syracuse game just was a like frustrating punt on trying to win the game. Again, Boston College was stupid. They beat wait. Again, the UNC I think the UNC win the UNC yeah. win was the game. If if we didn't beat UNC, the whole season would have looked Correct. a lot different, I feel like. Correct. So eight and four with wins over Wake and Carolina, you go, okay. And ECU, yeah. at ECU, again, it wasn't pretty, but I'll still take it all day long uh, against ECU. So uh, so kind of going into this next year, I think that a lot of people kind of look at it as 
okay, I mean, obviously Vegas has us at six and a half uh, wins uh, right now, which, you know, basically is saying that, you know, they'll expect you basically to be fighting to be bowl eligible. And definitely looking at the schedule this year, it's tough in terms of who you're playing, but I really do feel like that the toughest games that we play are at home between Notre Dame, Clemson, Miami, Miami. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, and obviously starting off against Notre, you know, Notre Dame at, at Carter Finley, the first time seeing, uh, you know, the scoreboard and the sound system noon on ABC, it's going to be crazy. And it's going to be, it's going to be an awesome environment. Uh, I, I can't wait for it. So, I mean, like, what would you just kind of put your expectations for this season as, and I mean, would you say that eight and four is far fetched or that's within reason? Well, I think never really go against Vegas. So six and six, seven and five okay. feels about. Um, I also think you got to remember this is a down year cycle for Dave, and in his down years, they've been yeah. four and eight and three and nine. So six, six seven, <laughs> five would, as I like to say, would be his best worst year. So that would all go a, a strange sign of progress for him. Uh, I just, it's just one of those years. I think the schedule is tough. And I do think there will be some adjustment there at offense. I'm really worried at receiver is where I'm primarily worried. Um, and, and offensive line, too. So we'll see. We'll see how it goes. But I think there's probably going to be some games where they look really good. And then there's probably going to be some games where you go, uh-oh. Um, and yeah. to me, that feels like six and six. Yeah. But do you, do you kind of take it as, Joe? Because at least for me, I kind of took it that – the fact that Doran basically got one wide receiver and transfer from Clemson and then just kind of stuck with it. Like, do you kind of take that as maybe that Doran felt confident in the room that he had uh, maybe more than, than us fans who aren't at practice, who aren't in meeting rooms, who aren't watching the film like he is maybe see. Could be. Could be. Best Could be. In the spring game were the true freshmen. So we'll see. Right. Yeah, and sure. I guess for me, the wide receiver room, there's lots of names that you've been hearing about for years, right? The Julian Grays, the Anthony Smiths, the Porter Rooks, Porter Rooks. Um, Terrell Timmons. Like, those are guys that were highly recruited, but they really haven't, for whatever reason, shown out on the field. And I know we've some of those guys have been sitting, you know, on the depth chart, but I feel like this could be a year where, like to Layton's point, where there's more talent than we're really giving it credit for, especially – and this type of offense where, you know, you know, it's the, you know, air raid and it's not going to be, you know, a halfback pass for two yards or a, a a tight end screen five yards in the backfield. Like, I feel like we're going to oh open God. it up a little bit more, not to throw shade to any previous coordinators, but kind of what are your thoughts there, Joe? <laughs> Let's hope so. I think. Yeah. <laughs> I think yeah. Opportunity for improvement is in play calling. Right. Absolutely. Because I felt like we got ourselves behind the chains way too often last year. And that, you know, we threw way too many times to the sticks and or like two yards short and like, okay, wide receiver, go make a play. And um mm -hmm. and I think that some of that was just play calling and um and I and I get it. We were down to our third and fourth string quarterbacks on some of that. So that definitely probably affects play calling with lack of reps. But I, I feel like in this offense with the nye looking at his past, you know, his pedigree and his past stops, I feel like this is going to feel different, but maybe I'm just bullish because I'm a guy wearing red and white right now. I like yeah. I like it. Yeah. Optimum. Yeah. So last, yeah. So, so last thing, Joe, to kind of wrap this thing up. Uh, so what would you say that um, are the keys for Dorn and NC State football next season to be successful. That if 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 Dorn is able to pull off a great season, at eight and four, pull off a couple of episodes, things like that. What are some of the things that he would have to do in order to get that done? Uh, I think the receivers will have to show us something that we we don't know yet. I think the offensive line will have to be better, and I think the play calling will have to be better. I think the defense is going to be fine. I think Brennan's going to be fine. Uh, I just think there's some concerns there. Who's actually going to make plays for the offense? And, and if you're going to try to run the ball which I'm not sure they're going to, um, then the offensive line needs to needs to improve as well. Yeah, that's true. Well, and, and that's why I think that maybe with the running back situation, having guys that are, you know, great kind of elusive backs, you know, kind of, you know, shorter, but very quick step guys like Michael Allen and Jordan Houston 
I think it kind of makes sense for that, just like just like you were saying. So it'll be interesting to see what the offense looks like. But all right, Joe, again, thank you so, so much again. Really do appreciate your time. Thank you so much again for coming back on again. Just like just like we have every single year. Go ahead and book us, you know, late May, early June 2024. We'll reach back out to you once again and have you back on. And uh, hopefully by that point, you and OVs are continuing to kill it and enjoy it on the YouTube side. And we'll be definitely cheering for you and uh, definitely wish you wish you and OVs all the best for sure. And in, in that and that endeavor, which seems to have gone great. So appreciate far. you, Leighton. Appreciate you, Greg. And see you guys. Carter Friendly Stadium when the season starts. Let's do it. I know. Looking forward. Looking forward to it. Thank you all so much again for tuning in with us. If you don't mind for us and for the OG, go ahead and hit that subscribe button, hit that notification bell. If you enjoyed this conversation, hit that like button and give us a follow Tuffy Talk now on Twitter, Instagram, and go give our guy Joe Julio, if you haven't already, which I don't know why, a follow on Twitter as well. And, and thank you all so much for tuning in and go pack, y'all. Go pack. Go pack.